Chapter Seventeen of Eyes Like the Sea by Mor Yokoi, translated by Arnis Pitbane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The most beautiful comet I ever saw was the comet of eighteen fifty eight. It was visible in the sky for a whole fortnight, from October first to fifteenth, and all the time the weather was as fine as could be, not a cloud in the sky. And meanwhile, the comet drew steadily nearer to the earth, growing bigger and bigger and in shape it exactly resembled a Turkish scimitar, and at last it was quite visible in broad daylight. I had very good cause for remembering this comet so well. In September of the same year I was seized with a hemorrhage of the lungs, an alarming symptom in a young man. Our doctor, Sebastian Andrew Kovacs of blessed memory, said that it was not medicine that I wanted, but change of air. I submitted to his directions, and at the beginning of the autumn I undertook an audacious expedition, to visit the western Carpathian Alps on horseback. Our good old friend, Gabriel Toruk, he had been a government commissioner during the revolution, and his two sons were my guides, for they had been all through those beautiful regions before. Five to six hours in the saddle every day for a fortnight, through pathless forests, up and down steep rocky precipices, wading through streams and mountain torrents, dancing of an evening at the balls frequently given in our honor, in the big-heeled boots that we had worn on horseback during the day, gobbling bacon as we stopped to rest on the fresh grass, and washing it down with a gurgling drink out of our brandy flasks. That is what I call a radical cure for inflammation of the lungs. It cured me, anyhow. With my suite, which gradually swelled to ten strong, I visited Bihar, and found out the rocky grave beneath which reposes my good friend, Paul Vosvery, who died such a heroic death. I also saw the Hungarian California, the gold diggings of Abrud Banya and Verespetek. I painted that marvelous basalt hill, De Tuanyata, than which it is impossible to imagine a more interesting formation. I was in Cetotie Mare, that overwhelming relic of the Roman power, a gigantic gold-producing hill entirely hallowed out by the slavish hands of a subjugated race. When they would have dug still deeper, the top of the scooped-out mountain fell in and buried beneath it both slaves and slaveholders. And there it stands now, a gaping chasm, like one of the circular mountains of the moon. I love to look back on this delightful tour, and the lovely comet accompanied me in the sky all the time. The result of my journey was that I returned home with perfectly healthy lungs. From the comet, moreover, I borrowed the idea of starting a weekly comic paper under the title of Ustekois. And this paper gave me something to do for the next fifteen years. During all that time it had great influence. With a preliminary and a supplementary censorship to deal with, it was only possible to say a word of truth or a word of encouragement in verse or by way of anecdote. Sometimes a printer's error served our turn instead. For instance, to the question, What shall a Hungarian man do now? The answer was, Varyan es Tyrian, wait and suffer. But by a printer's error, the Tyrian became Tur Yen, which the reader, in his own mind, would read as Tur Yen, let Tur come, and associated at once with the popular ballad sung from one end of the kingdom to another and which begins, Hoy's tear, Pitsta tour, he brings his musket. But the comet had another signification also. In those days war was our universal prayer, and the following year actually brought it. Napoleon III's historical New Year's greeting settled the dread destiny of the year. On that day my lieutenant again came to see me. I was still his guardian. His face beamed with joy. God be with you, my friend. It was a strange beginning. I suppose you've got your promotion in your pocket. Not that, but an order to march. Our whole regiment goes to Lombardy, and perhaps even farther. There will be war with Italy. But pray, don't say anything about it. Tis a state secret. I knew it long ago. From whom? From the chief of police himself. One day he summoned before him all the newspaper editors in Budapest, and sternly commanded them not to write a single letter as to the preparations for the impending war, and thus we heard all about the coming campaign from the very best authority. 
Well, they certainly might have acted more discreetly than that. Where, then, shall I send you your remittances in the immediate future? Nowhere at all, my dear friend. Bessie will remain here. Nobody is allowed to take his wife with him, not even the colonel. Whilst from the very day on which the war begins, I shall receive double pay. So give the money to Bessie. I'll send it to her. I say, give it to her. Take it yourself, personally. I am much obliged for your confidence. It is more than confidence. I wish you, while I am away, to go and see her, be her guest every day, and make yourself quite at home. The deuce! Do you consider me, then, one of those ninnies to whom one can confide a pretty woman a la trance? Au contraire, I am convinced of the contrary. I know that in such matters no reliance can be placed upon mere honor. The only thing a man expects from his worthy comrades is discretion. I am well informed of everything. My wife has confessed everything to me, the little wooden hut on the Comorn Island, and then the visit in your private room, the meeting at the pagan altar, he, 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 we all know the circumstances quite well. It was an unheard-of case, to think that a pretty woman should become the trumpet of her own notoriety. But, my dear comrade, on my word of honor— Here we have nothing to do with words of honor. You were in love with her once— and I need have no further fear of any one who used to love Bessie. Jupiter was the chief of the gods, and had the loveliest of women for his wife, yet he didn't keep the Ten Commandments. T'will be better to pour pure wine into our glasses, I think. But I repeat, I don't want to pour any wine at all into my glass. Stuff and nonsense! We know all about that. Bessie makes a fool of every man, and showers contempt on her worshippers. Of you alone does she always speak with rapture. Whenever your name is mentioned, she sighs deeply and says, Ah, and I might have been his, too. That proves all the more that our relations have been purely platonic. Very good indeed. What I like about you best of all is the serious face with which you are always able to defend your point of view. Another man in your place would rejoice at his good fortune. You nobly deny yourself. You will compromise nobody. You have the advantage over all my other good friends. I would rather entrust her to you than to anybody. But why not rather trust her to herself? Foster within her the sentiment of fidelity. Write to her every day from the camp. Nay, my friend, a letter won't do. I can't always be scribbling and raving to her. Bessie is not one of the romantic sort. You know all her various temperaments. Indeed, I know nothing of the sort. Well, I do, then. I know the moment I have cast my right foot over my horse's back she will be unfaithful to me. It is as much her nature to be so as it is my nature to fight, and yours to write. When I can't sit on horseback, I'm ill. When you can't write a romance, you're ill. And when a pretty woman is not flirting, she gets the migraine. Your hand upon it that you will visit my Bessie while I am far away and comfort her. And the tears really started to his eyes. Now— here was a situation which is not to be found in any romance, and which the reader will, I know, only accept as true under protest. A soldier departing for the wars forcibly compels his good friend to try and comfort the pretty wife he leaves behind him. But that that friend should kick and struggle with all his might against such a marvellous piece of good fortune is a fact which I am sure I shall never get the enlightened public to believe anyhow. My friend, said Kvatopil finally, drying the tears from his eyes and violently pressing one of my hands in one of his. You know that we valiant horsemen, dragoons and uhlans, are going down to Italy. The hussars have gone already. The volunteers will take our place here in garrison duty. During our absence down there they will be raging furiously here. If I thought that mine would be the shame to see my place here taken by one of those red-braided chicory hussars, I should be capable of blowing out first my wife's brains and then my own. Don't allow such a thing to happen. If one of those cockatoos were to see your Austrasian police, with the large Chalcedon buttons of yours hanging up in my antechamber, he would be scared into flight at once. At this we both laughed heartily. We took leave of each other very prettily. Kvatopil, with the fairest hopes, followed the glorious career which promised him fame and promotion. The whole kingdom waited for news from the seat of war with rapt attention. 
Our parting had taken place at the end of April. In May, the official newspapers gave us a brief account of the Battle of Montebello. It was not a regular pitched battle, but a forced reconnaissance by the Austrian general, with a jumble of some twelve thousand men of all arms. But the Austrians and the French fought bravely. The official communique did not give further details. I, however, through the kind offices of a courier sent from the seat of war to the commandant of Buda, also received a private letter from the field of battle. Kvatopil wrote thus, My dear friend, I hasten to write you after the battle. The whole of our regiment was under fire, repulsed the French chasseurs, and pursued them into Montebello. I received a slight wound in the forehead, which did not, however, prevent my further fighting. The commander-in-chief immediately promoted me to the rank of captain, and praised my valor in front of the regiment. Make known the joyous news to my dear wife. I am not able to write to her. A thousand kisses to the pair of you. Wenceslas Kvatopil, Captain. But there was a postscript also. P.S. Show this letter to nobody, and don't let it out of your hand. Destroy it when you have read it through, for, if it were discovered, it would bring me into the greatest trouble, as it is absolutely forbidden to write letters from the camp. That is why I have addressed it to you, instead of to my wife, for I can count upon your discretion. In her triumph she would show the letter everywhere. But you burn it. W.K. Now, this letter made it my positive duty to visit Bessie, for I could only tell her about it by word of mouth. I might indeed have destroyed Kvatopil's letter, then written its entire purport to his wife in a letter of my own, but in that case she would certainly have carried my letter from pillar to post, and the mischief would have been the same. If I went to her in broad daylight, everyone would see me. I could not go incognito, for I was as well known as a bit of bad money. Besides that, the Hungarian national costume was in fashion just then. Everyone who wore it might expect to have his name bawled after him in the street for a week afterwards at the very least. If, on the other hand, I were to go to Bessie when it was dark, and they were lighting the gas lamps, that would only make matters worse. And again, it would be an inconceivable absurdity not to suppose that one or other of Bessie's fair neighbors would not be looking out the windows of the house opposite, with the most persistent curiosity, to see who was going in at the gate. And if but one of them saw me, the whole theatre would know all about it on the morrow. A husband with a conscience, and there are such husbands, ought in such cases to stand before his wife with a demure countenance, and say to her honestly and openly, My dear angel, I am obliged to pay a disagreeable visit to this or that lady, and I don't half like it. I wish you would come too, whereupon the wife will naturally be quite magnanimous and say, Go along by yourself, my dear. You know that I am not a bit jealous. But my wife happened, just then, to be away acting at Skeged, and would not be back for a week. That would be an aggravating circumstance in case of a visit. While I was thus debating with myself, a smart little maidservant came to my door. She had a covered market-basket on her arm, and she drew out of it a neatly folded little billet doux, which she placed in my hand. The note smelt of celery, under which it had been put. I recognized the handwriting of the address. It was Bessie's. I opened and read it. The maid stood there and waited. At last she grew impatient of the long delay, and said, I am waiting for an answer. Oh, so you're still there? Stop a bit. I read the letter once more. My dear guardian, very serious business makes me send to you. Come and see me. As your honored wife is now engaged on a provincial tour, can't you come and dine with me today? We shall be all by ourselves. Bessie. Was there ever an odder reason, as your honored wife is now engaged on a provincial tour? No doubt she found that out in the Favarosi Lawpoik. But the conclusion, therefore, you can come and dine with me today, and finally, we shall be all by ourselves. If that wasn't a temptation, I don't know what is. I began to walk up and down. The maid waited to see if I was going to count how many paces it was from the window to the door. At last she grew importunate. Is there any answer, please? I have to go home and cook the dinner. Ah, yes, of course. Greet your mistress from me, and tell her that I'll come see her in the forenoon tomorrow. 
"'But I want to know whether you are coming to dinner, "'that I may arrange my cooking accordingly.' "'True. Then say I'll come to dinner.' In Bessie's house the custom seemed to prevail for the mistress to dine six days of the week with Duke Humphrey, and then on the seventh, her at-home day, to make a great parade before her guests. I was now running into the very centre of danger. I could not possibly back out of this engagement. A serious business, eh? I know it was serious enough to me. An ideal of my youth, and lovelier now than ever, with a husband of her own, too, and that husband a fine manly fellow. So far from being jealous, he had openly entrusted me with the consolation of his sorrowing spouse, and I am the last person in the world to be enrolled in the order of Ancaritis. I candidly admit that I am not a bit better than my neighbors, so I tricked myself out finely. I put on my new coffee-colored clothes with the antique buttons. I neatly tied my embroidered cravat. I drew on my cordophan leather boots with the silver spurs. I fastened a crane's plume in my new spiral hat. This was the audacious fashion of the year, and within a twelfth-month this costume was worn in the whole kingdom. And after that, I went to the barber's, and he twisted my thick blonde hair into masterly ringlets. Aggravating circumstances, the whole lot of them. End of chapter 17「Chapter eighteen of Eyes Like the Sea by Mora Yokoi, translated by R. Nisbet Bain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. How my heart beat when I set forth on my expedition. On the way from my dwelling to Bessie's lodgings, my ill fate brought me face to face with all the veteran actresses of the National Theatre, and they all stopped me and asked where I was going. They all remarked that I was very stylishly got up and they all shook their fingers at me and said, Fee, fee, you straw widower. The devil must really have been in me to make me take the trouble to have my hair so prettily frizzled. I was just about to dash hastily up the staircase of Bessie's dwelling, when whom should I run into but Tony Sagi? It only needed that. He came from the same town I did, was a common friend of all my friends, and was about as resident of news as a town crier. "'Your servant, friend. Why, you're quite a stranger. I've just come from Bessie. The young lady is in a very bad humour. She as good as pitched me out of doors. She must be expecting someone. Perhaps you are the very man, eh?' "'It was all up with me now. Tomorrow every newspaper in town will report my visit here, for quid licit bovi, non licit jovi. If I were to turn back now, it would only make matters worse. I hastened up the steps.' Bessie lived on the third floor. To get to her rooms I had to follow the open corridor which led down to the courtyard. I passed on my way the lodgings of a milliner, a female pawnbroker, and a lady who supplied families with servant-maids, and all three poked their heads out of their windows and watched me disappear. On reaching Bessie's number I found, tugging at the bell-rope, a red peluched young coxcomb. The door was about a fourth part open, and the face of a vicious-looking cook was protruding out of it. She dismissed the visitor with curt ceremony. "'My mistress is not at home.' We nearly trod each other's spurs off as we cannoned against each other in the narrow corridor. A minute afterwards the countenance of the same self-cook, rounded into complete amiability, again appeared, and she said to me, "'Would you do us the honour to walk in?' And she held the door wide open for me. You should have seen the face which my red, furbellowed gentleman made at this. It was not enough for him to open his eyes and mouth at me. He stuck his pince-nez on the bridge of his nose as well. That will mean a duel for me to-morrow. Meantime, however, I was master of the situation. I had to go through the kitchen to get to Bessie's room. The kitchen was also the antechamber. You hung up your overcoat there. Her cook was her only servant, parlour-maid, chambermaid, everything. "'Will you kindly walk into the saloon?' urged the servant. "'But announce me beforehand. Here's my card.' "'Beg pardon, but I can't take it. Both my hands are doughy.' She was in the middle of kneading some dough-cake or other with butter. "'Would you kindly put your card between my teeth?' Thus, like a retriever, she carried my card between her teeth. A moment afterwards she cried, "'Come in now, please.' 
I entered the room which the servant had called a saloon. Nobody was there. I looked around me. I found nothing there of the luxurious splendor which had surrounded the young lady formerly in her mother's house. But for all that, everything was neat and pretty. Embroideries, a music stand with songs upon it, and a fiddle, flower pots, a cage with exotic birds, Volachian aprons, skelter pottery, a few handsomely bound books. All these were so disposed as to fill the mind with a sense of refined elegance combined with the utmost simplicity. A curtained door led from the saloon to another room, possibly a bedchamber. In a few minutes this door opened, and the fair lady fluttered in. It did not escape my attention that the moment she entered, she turned her head on one side, and contracted her eyebrows as if to bid someone else remaining behind there to keep quiet. The momentary opening of the door also permitted me to see that in the direction in which she had looked was a tall tester bed, with the curtains drawn close. The moment, however, that she had shut the door behind her and turned towards me, the face of the lovely lady became all amiability. She hastened up to me and pressed my hand. "'It was very nice of you to come and see me. Don't be angry with me for giving you the trouble.' The lady was now more amiable than ever. She was in the simplest stay-at-home toilet. The only ornament on her head was her own bright silky hair, twisted up into a knot and tied at the top with a ribbon. She looked just as she was ten years before, a little girl of sixteen. Her whole being recalled to me her childish days. There was the same candid, guileless look, those open eyes through which you could read into her very soul, the same artless mouth. She invited me to sit down. She took my hat and laid it on the table. "'I suppose you'll remain to dinner. I have told the cook to prepare your favorite dish.' "'Then you know what it is?' "'Why, of course. Beans with pig's ear. Why, all your admirers throughout the kingdom know that.' I now had good reason to be proud. My nation, then, had some regard for me, after all. To others it presents bays. To me, beans.' "'In that case, I'll remain,' I said. "'In Kvatopil's time I was never permitted to cook beans, "'for he maintained that they make a man stupid. "'On the contrary, Pythagoras assures us "'that the bean contains the same component parts as the human brain. "'Having thus rehabilitated the bean, "'I reverted to the real motive of my visit there. "'I should have come to visit you today "'even without a special invitation.' Was there any special reason, then, why I should occupy a place in your thoughts? I have received a letter from Italy, the contents of which will greatly interest you. At these words she looked at me as coldly as if she had become an alabaster statue. Interest me? So I believe. On the twentieth instant there was a battle on the Menicio at which your husband distinguished himself. Really? said the lady mechanically. Really? In that tone, it was rather odd. However, I went on. Nay, in the heat of the combat he was even wounded. I calculated surely on the dramatic effect of these words. I fancied that the tender spouse would leap to her feet, pale, ready to faint, wringing her hands, till at last, amidst sobs, the name of the adored husband would burst forth from her lips. Oh, my Wenceslas! Oh, my Kvatopil! but she did not so much as turn her head round. Indeed, she said, with complete sangfroid, just as if it were an everyday occurrence for a beloved husband to be wounded in battle. I was offended. Such ungrateful indifference I had never met with before. How was I to go on? I had calculated that when the despairing consort had wept and sobbed her fill, I should hasten to console her. It is true, said I, that his wound is not sufficiently dangerous to prevent him from continuing in the field. "'I can easily believe it,' replied the lady, with a shrug of the shoulders. Now this was a want of feeling worthy of an alligator. Surely she had the nerves of a rhinoceros. I was not prepared for this reception. I can easily believe it. Was that all? Well, then, if our tender feelings are so hermeneutically sealed, we must try what more drastic means will do.' We must appeal to other sentiments. Vanity, for instance, is a sentiment which can never be blunted. So I moved forward my heavy artillery. Lieutenant Kvatopil, I said, 
was called to the front and made a captain straight off for heroic valor in the field. But even at this the lovely lady did not fling herself on my neck. She did not even utter a sound, but contracted the corners of her mouth. What did that mean? When you tell a lieutenant's wife that from today she has the right to the title Mrs. Captain, that everyone who meets her in the street and congratulates her will address her as Frau Ritzmeisterin, while the other lieutenant's wives naturally burn with secret envy, that she may now print her corresponding rank on her visiting cards. When you tell her all this, and even then no impression is produced, and the cherry lips do not expand with joy, revealing the sparkling, pearly teeth and the dimples on the sun-bright face, when, instead of that, she purses up her mouth so nastily and gives herself a double chin, what are you to think? There is nothing so hideous as a pretty woman with a double chin. A double chin makes a woman look absolutely old. I was quite confused. What am I to do to amuse her now? Should I talk about the weather? May I congratulate you, I said, seizing her hand. But not only did she not press my hand in return, as she ought to have done, on the contrary, she irritably drew it back and turned aside her head. Suddenly a light flashed through my brain, a light kindled by my immeasurable self-conceit. Why go on praising the distant husband, I said to myself, when you yourself are present? Do you think she invited you to a dinner to sing the praises of Wenceslas Kvatopil? I drew my chair near to the sofa on which Bessie was sitting, and airily passed my hand through my frizzled locks. Bessie observed the movement, and quickly turned her face towards me. A mocking smile suddenly lighted up her face, a smile from which a man can read a whole chapter in a moment. That is something like stenography. Ha ha, sir! Then we have come thither with that thought, have we? We have had our hair frizzled, eh? We have decked ourselves out to be irresistible, I know. A thousand mocking fish-tailed nixies were wriggling about in those sea-like eyes. It was a murderous sort of smile. I was conscious of having been taken down pretty considerably. Here was I, quite contrary to my usual custom, tricked and furbished up like a petit maître, while she, the lady, received me in her simplest barracan house-dress, without any finery, and with a smile she discharged at me the saying of the great poet, O oh, vanity, thy name is woman. But why, then, had she sent for me? Why had she driven away one visitor, and denied herself to another, if not for my sake? Perhaps for the sake of a third party who had already arrived? When she came out of her boudoir, she seemed to me to be signaling with her eyebrows at some one. I quickly pulled myself together. I fancy I must have been very red in the face, and I certainly had good reason to be ashamed of myself. I saw that I had not been able to reap laurels in the role of Don Juan, so I began to take up the part of Tartuffy. Let us play the righteous judge. Perhaps I have not come at a very convenient time? On the contrary, I asked you to come at this time. On a serious business, eh? A serious business for me. But isn't what I've just been saying to you serious? Apparently. Yet you received it with a very queer face. I listened seriously enough. But the affair had its cheerful aspect also, surely. The fair dame made a contemptuous clicking with her tongue. Don't you feel any interest, then, in Kvatopil's heroism, wounds, distinction, and promotion? No, she replied resolutely, almost snapping my sentence in two. Her eyes sparkled like burning naphtha lakes. No, I replied in amazement. You take no interest in your husband's fate, whether it be bad or good? You feel neither hot nor cold on the subject? No. No, again. But you parted in the greatest affection when he went to the wars? True. And it is scarcely a month since then. Only twenty-nine days. I've counted them. And meanwhile winter has come? It has. After that she began to laugh maliciously. She leaped to her feet and rumpled my frizzy hair with her fingers. Let's leave the matter till after dinner. Then I'll tell you everything. But don't let us spoil a good dinner in the meantime. You are quite horrified at me now, and fancy that I have laid a trap for you. You will see later on that this serious business of mine is not a joke. Let us leave it till after the black coffee. 
I revived again. The lady was capricious, and it suited her. I was determined to give you a good dinner. I owe you your revenge. It is a long time since we dined together. Last time I was your guest. Don't you remember? At the pagan altar. I never ate so heartily. What splendid toast you had! And the bacon, too, broiled on a stick. Why, I've got the taste of that good red pepper of yours in my mouth to this day, and now I mean to give you hospitality that you will remember for a long time. This again was delightfully reassuring. She was of the true cat species. She purrs and fondles, but one must be continually on one's guard against her claws. Come now, help me to lay the table. My cook has enough to do without that. So I had to help her lay the table, for the saloon was the dining room also. One had only to remove the books, porcelain vases, and china knick-knacks from the table in front of the sofa, and then cover it with a tablecloth. I was curious to see how many she would lay for. Only for two. Two plates, two knives, forks and spoons, and two glasses. But how about that third person, that person in the bedroom yonder? or had I rightly interpreted that peculiar expression of hers, I was beginning to think the whole thing was pure hallucination on my part. Suddenly the scraping of a cautiously moved chair sounded from the boudoir. I saw the lady was considerably put out, and felt decidedly uncomfortable. She wrathfully pressed her lips together. "'Have you anyone in the next room?' I inquired in a stern judicial voice. "'I have,' she replied defiantly. "'Madam,' I exclaimed, in virtuous high dudgeon. "'Would you like to know who is inside?' she cried in an offended tone. "'Oh, dear, no, I'm not a bit curious,' said I, and began looking about for my hat and stick. "'But I wish you to know,' she cried indignantly. Barring my way and, seizing my hand, she led me to the door of the bedroom and hastily flung it open. In the room a blonde young lady stood before me, gazing at me with wondering large blue eyes. Bessie introduced this lady to me. Madame Wenceslas Kvatopil, from Krakow. Then she pulled aside the bed curtains, and on the bed was lying a little girl about eleven years of age. This is Wenceslas Kvatopil's daughter. Poor things, let us leave them alone. For at least a minute I felt as if some magic power were whirling me round and round the globe with it from the North Pole to the equator and back again. How I got out of that room into the other I really cannot say. Before me continually were the faces of that large-eyed, timid-looking woman and the little girl. I heard the sound of weeping behind me. It was Bessie. She had hidden her face in her hands and was sobbing. Oh, how I loved that man! How good, how perfect I thought him. I fancied him a model man. Even now I cannot accuse him. It was not his fault, but mine alone. His sin is my crime. Oh, what folly! Let us speak of the situation seriously. You know now, I suppose, why I wanted to see you. I wished to ask your advice. I sat down beside her. Bessie dried her eyes and then began to speak quite soberly. The whole world judges me wrongly. They fancy I am full of levity, but if anything pains me, the pain lasts a long, long time. Since he went away, I have been nowhere and seen nobody. If any of my old acquaintances came to see me, I told them that the whole place was topsy-turvy, and there was not even a chair to sit down upon. My servant had orders to say to everyone who called, with one exception, that I was not visible. Who was this exception? Yourself. She could easily guess whom I meant, and if she didn't guess it, it didn't much matter. When he had to go away so suddenly, he was in a very tender mood. He wanted me to swear that I would not be faithless while he was away. He even brought me a crucifix for the purpose, and when he saw that I laughed at him, he besought me, if I really must deceive him, at least not to bestow my favors upon the first ragamuffin that turned up. Nay, he even took the trouble to indicate a worthy man to me, of whom he could not be jealous, whereupon I told him, very seriously, that the man he meant was capable of killing anybody who stood in the way of his love, but was altogether incapable of flinching love from anybody else. At this my face grew very red indeed. Then he suddenly assumed a mystic mood, 
He knew my weak side. He said, If you deceive me for the sake of any other man, at that same moment I shall die. Day and night I stand where death is meted out every instant, and the moment a kiss from your lips touches the lips of another man, at that selfsame moment, I say, the bullet which is lying in wait for me will fly straight to my heart. A horrible saying, it would not let me sleep, and rose up before me in my dreams. When one or other of my lady friends came to visit me, and we fell a-chatting and began to laugh and joke, a sort of cold shiver would suddenly run all down my body. While I am smiling, I thought, perhaps he is dying a death of torments beneath the horse's hoofs. Every savoury morsel sticks in my throat when I think, perhaps he is now suffering hunger and thirst. And when the blast shakes my windows, I think, now he is standing defenceless amidst the tempest and freezing, and I unable to protect him. In short, this threat of his made me quite a sonomulist. At last I denied myself even to my lady friends. I became quite morbid. I fancied I had no right to be gay. Ten times a day I went to the crucifix, by which he had wished me to swear, and knelt down before it to pray. I made all sorts of vows, provided he were preserved and brought back safely to me. And yet I am a Calvinist. But that crucifix was his— he remained faithful to it through all his change of faith. In fact, I was in a fair way of becoming a pietist. I began to think a life of virtue very beautiful. I should very much have liked to see you now and again, if only to show you that I could be just as moral as you. I would have praised your wife to you, and you would have returned the compliment by praising my husband. This would have been my ambition. It was the cook who interrupted this burst of feeling. "'Shall I bring in the stew, madam?' "'Yes, bring it in, if it is ready.' Then she turned to me to explain the circumstances of the case. "'I have to let these ladies have their food cooked separately, for Magyar dishes would make them mortally ill. That is why I don't lay the table for three. Your favorite dishes would be death to these Germans.' The cook now brought in the stewed chicken. Bessie tasted it first with a little spoon to see if it were salted enough, and also to see whether the cook had put parsley in it by mistake, for the doctor who was attending the little girl had forbidden every sort of seasoning ingredients in her food. Then she herself sliced up a roll of the best white bread for the little girl, poured some water for her into a glass, and warmed it a little by holding it tightly for a while between the palms of her hands, instead of popping a live coal into it, as thoughtful mothers often do for their sick children. For the mother of the child, however, she had a bottle of Pilsener beer uncorked and sent to her. Only when they had dined was our dinner served. Meanwhile, we did not resume our interrupted conversation. The servant was constantly passing in and out, and we could not speak before her. Then, after that, when we sat down to dinner, and a bitter meal it was to me, the thread of our conversation was broken as often as the cook came in with a new dish, or to change a plate, and all the time she played the part of the amiable hostess, inviting me to fall in in good old Hungarian style. One morning, she said, while I was doing my hair, my servant came and told me that a shabby-looking woman was outside, with a biggish girl, making inquiries about the lieutenant. I went out to them into the kitchen. I saw before me a blonde, blue-eyed woman, of about the same age as myself, and clinging to her arm was a lanky slip of a growing girl about ten or eleven years of age. In the woman's hand was a travelling bag and an umbrella. She was in bourgeois costume, without the fashionable crinoline, and on her head was a simple felt cap. Her girl was dressed in just the same way. They both wore their hair quite smooth and combed back from the forehead. The woman wished me good day in German. I asked her what she wanted. The woman replied that she wanted her husband, Mr. Wenceslas Kvatopil. The lieutenant? When he left me he was only a lieutenant. I quickly caught her by the hand and led her out of the kitchen into the saloon. My servant, fortunately, did not understand German. I led them right into my bedroom. I invited them both to be seated. Ah, that will do us good, said the woman, for we have come a long way. We have come here from Krakow. Surely not on foot. On foot all the way. We couldn't afford to come by rail. Just fancy. 
The very thought is terrible. To come on foot all those hundred miles hither from Krakow with a growing girl. Can one's imagination realize such a thing? Are you the wife of Lieutenant Wenceslaus Kvatopil? I inquired of the woman. I am, and this is his daughter, Mariana. And by way of proving her assertion, she drew from her traveling bag her marriage lines, extracted from the registers of the Cathedral of Krakow, to wit, bridegroom, Wenceslaus Kvatopil, sub-lieutenant of the blank dragoons, bride, Anna Dunkircher, witnesses, Baboleshki, colonel, and Kalmarski, shopkeeper, officiating clergyman, Stanislaus Lubrowski, dated February 16th, 1846. Then she showed me the baptismal certificate of the daughter, Mariana, born in lawful wedlock, June 19th, 1846. Father, sub-lieutenant, Wenceslaus Kvatopil. Mother, Anna Dunkircher. Officiating clergyman, Stanislaus Lubowski. Godparents, the above-mentioned marriage witnesses. A marriage contract, duly attested, was also among the documents. All at once Bessie burst out laughing. The cook came in and brought the soup. <laughs> Do you know why, according to Ollendorf, the captain weeps? Because the Englishman has no bread. Look, Susie, you've forgotten to give my guardian some bread. Give him a crusty bit. He likes that. The servant apologized, but said she didn't think the soup required bread. It was excellent soup, made of cream and eggs and rice and finely chopped chicken, Bessie filled my plate with it. Thank you. That will be enough. When the servant went out, we resumed our conversation. And here, may I remark, by the way, that there is no more pleasant tete-a-tete -tete in the world than that which is interrupted every ten minutes or so by the incursions of the servants. End of Part 1 of Chapter 18《ハッピーチャプターエイティーン》パート2の Eyes Like the Sea by モール・ヨコイ、Translated by R. Nisbet Bain。The Slipper Box Recording is in the Public Domain。Recording by Marianne。Now we know, said I, what was the cause of the extraordinary phenomenon of a happy bridegroom beginning to sob bitterly immediately after his marriage. It was his deserted wife and child that the poor fellow was thinking about. True, but don't let your soup cool on that account. Would you like a little parmesan with it? Thank you, but I like it much better without. Wenceslas Kvatopil liked his with parmesan. Then we settled down to our soup. Wenceslas Kvatopil always had a second serving of rice soup. Thank you, but I never take a second serving of any dish. I know that, and I also know that it is your habit to leave the best bit at the side of your plate. How did you come to know that? I first observed it when I was a little girl, and you sometimes came to dine with us. They say that it is a species of superstition. The titbit placed at the side of the plate signifies that our distant true love is suffering from hunger. It is no superstition, but a simple rule of health to leave off eating and drinking while your appetite is still at its best. Thus we continued our dietetic discussions as if we had no other desire in the world than to live a ripe old age and be free from gout. I have already mentioned that there was chopped-up chicken in the soup, and that portion of the chicken fell to Bessie's lot, which is known as the spur-bone. Now, it is a well-known custom among young unmarried ladies in confidential conclave, when one of them gets such a spur-bone, for her to invite her fair colleague to crack the bone with her. One of them then takes one end of the spur-bone, and the other takes the other end, and they pull away in different directions till the bone comes in two. Whichever of them gets the spur portion will be married soonest. That is a fantastic sort of superstition, if you like. Bessie laughed and said, When we ate our first dinner together, a spur bone of this sort fell into my hands. I stretched it out towards Anna. Pull, I said, and see which of us is to have kvatopil. Then you got to be good friends pretty quickly? Why shouldn't we? Hadn't we both the same husband? I naturally kept them here with me, I don't know what would have become of them if I hadn't taken them in. At this moment they haven't got a farthing. They travelled the whole distance on coffee only. They had no other upper garments but what they were actually wearing on their bodies. 
My first duty was to get them properly dressed. My clothes fitted the woman very well, and I bought some for the child in Carapacy Street. But the little one had to take to her bed immediately, for she had a bad headache and was very feverish. I sent for a doctor, and he gave her some medicine which sent her to sleep. She and her mother have slept in my bed ever since, and I sleep on the sofa. Won't you have a little liver? No, thank you. Pray, go on. When the poor lady saw that I received her kindly, her heart melted. She fell upon my neck, and our tears flowed like spring showers. We knew that one of us would be the death of the other, but which was to be the victim? Then we quickly told each other our experiences of our common husband, and how we had first met him. I could make a strange, dramatic scene out of it. I inquired, Come now, Anna, tell me, how did you first meet with Kvatopil, and how could you remain absent from him for thirteen years? Anna replied, It is a strange story. Do you happen to know, Bessie, the history of the Krakow Republic? I. No, dear, I never heard of the poor thing. Anna. Then you must know that it is a large Polish town where the Polish kings were formerly crowned and buried when they died. I am a native of that city. My father was a famous glove-maker in Krakow, whose goods were sold far and wide. Our town was the last free Polish republic when Poland was finally partitioned. Its territory consisted of twenty-two square miles. Less than Drabitsen, I interrupted. Bessie went on with Anna's narrative. When I was a little girl ten years of age, a fresh Polish insurrection broke out. The united forces of the Austrians, Russians, and Prussians again put it down, and the care of the Krakow Republic was entrusted to Austria. The old Polish customs and assemblies remained in force, but Austrian soldiers garrisoned in the citadel continually. When I was sixteen years old, my mother died, and I had to take her place behind the counter. Here I made the acquaintance of Kvatopil. He was a young sub-lieutenant, and he generally came in to our shop to buy his gloves. Would that he had stopped short at gloves! Can any one justly give a bad name to a young girl because she is confiding? I believed in him, and he really had such a good heart. When he saw that I had only to choose between shame and death, he went to my father and begged for my hand. Naturally they gave us to each other. It was never the custom among the Poles, when a girl married a soldier, for her to go and ask permission first of all from the military authorities, and deposit a terribly big sum by way of caution money. The priest simply united us without any questionings. We had not been man and wife a week when the revolution again broke out. Krakow was the center of the Polish rising. At first the Polish rebels fought with great success. I saw the Polish scythemen drive my husband's cavalry regiment from one end of the street to the other. My husband had not even time to say good-bye to me. "'Then you are a Pole,' said I. "'Why shouldn't I be?' replied Anna. "'Surely I may be a Pole, though I have a German name. Dark days followed. My little girl was born. Twice a day I felt bound to go to church, the first time to pray that my country might triumph, and the second time to pray that my husband might return to me. A mad idea, wasn't it? Surely it is impossible for deity even to grant two diametrically opposed prayers at the same time? My husband returned indeed to Krakow, but the Polish cause was crushed. The champions of freedom fled in all directions, and the garrison troops returned. It was a sad meeting. After that catastrophe, Krakow ceased to be a republic and was incorporated with the Austrian hereditary possessions as a simple city. My father wept, but I rejoiced because I had got my husband back. But very soon I was punished for my criminal joy. My husband informed me that things were going badly with us. Hitherto the Austrian officers in Krakow had not been wont to ask permission of their general to marry. Now, however, when Krakow had been joined to Austria, the military regulations of the rest of the empire had been extended to us, and a lieutenant's wife had to pay down caution money to the amount of seven thousand florins. My father was incapable of raising such a sum. He had another daughter besides me, and could not withdraw so large a sum from his business. Danger threatened us if my husband's superiors discovered his marriage, for in such a case Kvatopil would have been degraded to the ranks. 
My father suggested that Kvatopil should quit the profession of arms and settle down to some sort of profession. But it was an impossible idea. Who would give employment in Krakow to an Austrian officer who had taken up arms against the Poles? Just about this time, too, Kvatopil was promoted to the rank of senior lieutenant. This at once inflamed our hearts with the joyous hope that he would rapidly scale the ladder of promotion, and we knew that if once he became a major, he would not have to deposit his matrimonial caution money, and we might then fearlessly publish the fact that we were man and wife. Nobody knew of it hitherto except our friends and relations. So we agreed to keep it quiet, and immediately afterwards Kvatopil and his regiment were transferred to Hungary. Since the revolution broke out in Hungary, I have heard nothing more of Kvatopil. I know not where he is, or what has become of him, or whether he is alive or dead. No tidings of him whatever. In times of war they make a mystery of the whereabouts of this or that regiment. Once we read from a bulletin that my husband's regiment had taken part in a battle in the Bonnet. My poor father then resolved to go personally to the Bonnet and inquire of the colonel whether my husband was still alive. Just as he got there, they were burying the colonel with great pomp. He had died of typhus fever. He had been the witness of our marriage, and was the only one of the officers who knew anything about it. He had kept his secret well, for his officiating as a witness at an irregular ceremony might have cost him his place also. All that the lieutenant colonel could tell us of Kvatopil was that his company had been detached on some expedition and had not come back. Possibly the Hungarian insurgents had eaten them all up. I could thus very well put on and wear mourning, and till the end of the war I heard not a word about my husband. So far spoke Anna, but now I began to speak. You didn't hear of him, because all through the campaign he was closely invested in the besieged Temesvar with his company, and no news could come out of that place till the end of the year. But why couldn't he let me hear from him when Temesvar was free again? He could at least have written that he was still alive. The cause of that is easy to find. So far as he was concerned, the whole campaign was sterile of glory. As a cavalry officer he was unable to be of any service to the besieged city. At the end of the campaign he still remained a senior lieutenant, whilst all the others had reached the rank of captain. Bitter disappointment was all that remained to him. An officer who is passed over is worse off than if he were dead. He cannot even say, Thank God, I am still alive. But subsequently, in all these latter years, why didn't he write to me all these three or four years, if but a line to say he was still alive and thinking of me, and of the child whom he loved so much? I can tell you the reason for that also, I said. To save a frivolous comrade he got into debt, and fell into the hands of unmerciful usurers, who immediately dragged him deeper into the mire. An officer in such a vexatious position is certainly not very much inclined to fetter himself with a wife and child as well. It is now not only the want of caution money which separates him from you, but also the nasty bog called debt. This bog he cannot wade through. If under such circumstances he thinks of his wife and child, that only increases his despair. If he wrote you a letter at all, it would only contain these lines. By the time you read these lines, I shall have ceased to exist. Anna was curious to know how far into debt Kvatopil had actually got. I immediately mentioned the neat little sum it amounted to. You should have seen what a long face my friend pulled. She asked me in consternation whether this immense load of debt still remained upon him. The situation was so droll that, despite all its bitterness, I couldn't help laughing. I could read from the poor simple creature's face that if I were to say to her, My dear, sweet friend, debt is the one thing in this earth which the tooth of time never nibbles. Kvatopil's bills still live. This was quite true, but they were living in my strong box. She would have been capable, poor unhappy lady, of taking her little girl by the hand and walking all the way back to Krakow. But I was sorry for the poor thing. I told her the pure naked truth. Four years long her husband had told her nothing of his goings-on because of his creditors, but after that time because of me. I made his acquaintance. I did not know that he was married. I fell in love with him and offered him my hand. I was bound to acknowledge that he had hesitated to accept it. 
He made all sorts of excuses except the unexceptionable one that he had a wife already. But as he was already up to his eyes in hot water, he had no choice but to blow his brains out or commit bigamy. Apparently, he regarded the latter alternative as the less unpleasant one. Anna herself admitted that it was very much wiser of Kwatopil to have chosen the latter course. What a good, affectionate creature the woman was! I then satisfied her that I had paid off worthy Kvatopil's debts before his marriage. I even showed her the bills preserved in my strong-box, explaining to her besides that they had now expired, but that I did not mean to proceed against Kvatopil for the amount in spite of our altered relations. At this the good soul fell down at my feet, shedding tears of gratitude. She even kissed my knees, and assured me that she would bless my memory to the very day of her death. Ever since this comforting reassurance on my part, her tender inclination for the beloved Kvatopil was perfectly re-established. I put the finishing touch to my kind-heartedness by describing to her the scene when Kvatopil, as bridegroom, fell to weeping bitterly after the wedding. There could be no doubt that those bitter tears were shed on account of his forsaken wife and daughter. This quite overcame poor Anna. Look now, what a good heart poor Kvatopil has! said she. Then we began quoting to each other the various noble traits that we had mutually discovered in Kvatopil's character. "'Well, did you find the pig's ears with beans to your liking, sir?' inquired the cook of me at that moment, as she came in to change the dishes. "'On my word of honour as a poet, I have never tasted such pig's ears and beans,' I replied. An apricot pasty followed, of which, I confess it freely, I am also fond— Bessie then continued her story. I went to my lawyer, put my case before him, and asked him what he advised me to do in my situation. I applied to him first, a dry, prosaic man, with his mental vision bounded by the law. After that, I wanted to lay the matter before you, that you might judge between us. Between whom? Between me and my lawyer, for we are of diametrically opposed views as to what I ought to do next. Then you have a view on the subject, too? Of course I have, but listen first to the view of the man learned in the law, and before you do that, let us drink to the health of those we love, and those who love us. We drank the toast accordingly, but we mentioned no names. And now, listen to the opinion of the lawyer. It is a great misfortune, certainly, he said, but the only person to suffer will be Anna Dunkirker, if we lived in ordinary peaceful times, the business might be settled by the military authorities compelling Lieutenant Wenceslas Kvatopil to renounce his rank by marrying contrary to the regulations. In that case, the marriage contracted with Anna Dunkircher would remain valid. On the other hand, according to the tenor of the Austrian criminal law, Mr. Kvatopil would then have the pleasant prospect of two years' imprisonment for the subsequently committed crime of bigamy. Nevertheless, under our present circumstances, when the army of Lombardy has great need of every valiant and experienced officer, the Krakow wife would, undoubtedly, get this answer for her trouble. Your marriage has been contracted illegally, and is consequently null and void. The parson who joined them would be sent for a twelfth-month to a monastery by way of penitential discipline. But Wenceslas Kvatopil would remain a lieutenant, or even, if he distinguished himself, become a captain. You, consequently, will be Mrs. Lieutenant, and perhaps Mrs. Captain, for the annulling of the former marriage will restore to you all your rights. Those were the lawyer's words. I laid them to heart. Now, do you know anything of marital law? I frankly confess that marital law occupies a most prominent place among those sciences which I do not know. Well, I'll tell you what I replied to him. Good, I said. The laws, the circumstances, the position of things, everything, in fact, proves, and proves to demonstration, that Anna Dunkircher has forfeited all her marital rights. But has not the law of the human heart also its validity? Do I express myself in proper legal phraseology? At this I couldn't help laughing, but she proceeded with her story. My lawyer was very far indeed from laughing. What, said he? Do you imagine that Wenceslas Kvatopil's heart still beats for his first wife whom he deserted? To whom he did not write of set purpose? Not even when he could, 
lest he might thus have supplied some written testimony to the fact of her really having been Wenceslas Kvatopil's lawful spouse, and not merely some betrayed girl with whom he had, at some time or another, unlawfully cohabitated? Do you fancy that Wenceslas Kvatopil, thirteen years after the event, is still so romantic as to ask for his dismissal from the service in the middle of a campaign, on the very field of battle, and desert the standard of his sovereign, whom he has sworn to obey, simply to enable Anna Dunkircher to save her matronly dignity? Do you fancy that Wenceslas Kvatopil will throw up his career at the very moment when it is full of the most brilliant hopes for him, and allow himself to be shut up as a felon for a couple of years, at the end of which time he will be discharged a branded beggar, simply to live for the rest of his life as the lawful husband of a beggar-woman even more beggarly than himself? And finally, do you imagine that Wenceslas Kvatopil has so completely lost the use of his five senses as to be capable of spurning away from him, and exposing to the contempt of the whole world, a young and lovely consort like yourself, a rich and noble lady who can keep him in comfort for the rest of his days, and all for what? For the sake of taking back a faded, withered woman, whose face is wrinkled with care, who is the daughter of an honest glover, to whom it would be no advantage to stick the name of Kvatopil on his signboard instead of the time-honoured firm of Dunkircher? No, madam, that he is such a good-hearted man as all that I do not for one moment believe. I would as soon believe in sea-maidens with finny tails, upon my word I would. I did not interrupt my lawyer, I allowed him to have his say out, but when he made a brief pause I said to him, I am not speaking of Kvatopil's heart, but of my own. Your own, cried he in amazement, what has your heart got to do with it? I have my own notion of settling this painful business, I said. I propose to transfer to Anna Dunkircher the surety money which I deposited on the occasion of our marriage, and then she will have satisfied the conditions imposed on officers who marry, and may she and her husband be happy. I can easily disappear somewhere in the crowd. The world is large. At this the lawyer flew into a passion. If you do that, he cried, you are only fit to be locked up in a lunatic asylum at Dubling. Nevertheless, concluded Bessie, it is my serious fixed resolve to do so. I could not help laying my hand on hers. What true, what noble sentiments were slumbering in that heart! If only she had some one to awaken them! What an excellent lady might have been made out of this woman, if she had only met with a husband who, in the most ordinary acceptance of the word, had been a good fellow, as is really the case with about nine men out of every ten. Why should she have always managed to draw the unlucky tenth out of the urn of destiny? She guessed my thoughts during that moment of silence. Those large, deep, fiery eyes slowly filled with tears. The fire of a diamond is nothing to be compared with the fiery sparkle of those tears. How lovely she was at that moment! Her lips began to quiver, and she could scarcely pronounce the words. That other woman had a child. At this she began to sob convulsively, covering her face with one hand and squeezing my hand violently with the other. My heart was so touched that, a very little more, and I should have mingled my tears with hers. When she had wept out her bitter mood, she sighed deeply and dried her tears. "'Now you know why I asked you to come here,' she said. "'Be you the judge in this matter. Which is right, the reason or the heart? Am I to do what my lawyer advises, or what my own feelings suggest?' It was a difficult matter. "'Let us see,' I said. "'Can't we hit upon some middle course?' I advise you neither to do what your lawyer advises, nor what you yourself propose. Wait a bit. The great war is still going on. More than a million of warriors are standing face to face. Not a fifth part of that number will return to their homes when the war is over. In this war, your Kvatopil will either fall or remain alive. If he falls, you can both go into mourning. You need not quarrel about the widow's veil. If, however, Kvatopil survives the end of the war, a brave and ambitious officer like him will undoubtedly have mounted higher on the ladder of promotion. The battlefield is the forcing-house of advancement. 
he will have become a major, and as a major he will not be required to deposit any matrimonial caution money. He can then take his Anna Dunkircher, and you will have no need to surrender your guarantee money, which you want very much yourself. I thank you, said the lady. Tis every bit as simple as the egg of Columbus. Then we'll wait, Anna and I, till the war is over, and till then we'll make one family. Let me call your attention to one thing, however. For the present it would be well if you were to hide yourself somewhere, in some little town, for instance, where nobody knows you. Here, in this capital, you will quickly find yourself in an awkward and untenable position. The story of the first wife will very quickly be known by all the world. The title of Straw Widow would do pretty well, perhaps, but the title of Straw Wife won't do at all. Pack up your traps, I say. Go straight off to the country to-morrow, and take your guests along with you. I'll do so. We had scarcely finished speaking when the doctor knocked at the door. When there's sickness in the house, one cannot deny oneself to the doctor. The doctor, too, was an old acquaintance of mine. He had a very extensive practice, and he was a homeopathist. I could take it as absolutely certain that when he went his rounds among his patients on the morrow, he would let them have, in addition to their nux vomica, or whatever else it might be, the very latest bit of scandal, to wit, that he had found me closeted with the pretty lady, and both of us in our cups, teacups, of course. I waited till he came back from his little patient. He satisfied us that there was no danger, and that she might leave her bed. Bessie asked whether the girl might be taken into the country. Yes, it will do her good. The doctor and I left at the same time. I had no sooner got out of the door than I again stumbled upon Tony Soggy. Corporal de Bacco, and have you been sitting all this time with that pretty young lady? And you have been walking all this time in front of the door, eh? The window of the house opposite was full of inquisitive female faces. I rushed into a coach and had myself driven to the railway station. The same evening I was at Seged. There I remained for three days, and stayed with my wife till her provincial engagement was over. On every one of those three days one or two anonymous letters reached my wife from Budapest of the following import. My poor dear friend, your husband passes whole nights and days with his former love lady, the lieutenant's wife. Our hearts bleed for you. The whole town knows all about it. How we did laugh at these letters! But what if I had not traversed the intentions of our dear friends? End of chapter 18「Chapter Nineteen of Eyes Like the Sea by Mor Yokoi, translated by R. Nisbet Bain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. It fared with Wenceslas Kvatopil as I had predicted. I am very sorry, but I really can't help it. Willingly would I bring him back a full major if it depended on me, but it was written in the Book of Fate that the worthy officer was to end his heroic career on the battlefield. He had at least the consolation of falling in a famous battle. While McMahon, at Solferino, broke through the mass of Schlick's forces, Benedek, on the right wing, pressed victoriously forwards, and drove the Piedmontese army, under Victor Emmanuel, as far back as San Martino. And there it was that a mortal bullet struck Captain Kvatopil through the heart. Yet I am able to say that at that moment the kisses of his lovely wife pressed the lips of nobody but his own deserted daughter. The two widows could now share the widow's veil between them in peace. The bigamy became known, but of course they could not bring an action for it against a dead man. The events of those great days quickly obliterated all recollection of the petty scandal. Both Anna and Bessie could now assume the title of Widow Kvatopil, and nobody could have a word to say against it. There was this little difference, however, that while the one might style herself Mrs. Captain Kvatopil, the other only the right to Mrs. Lieutenant. By the intervention of her lawyer, and with my consent as her guardian, Bessie recovered her deposited caution money. One thousand florins of it she gave as a gift to Anna, who returned with it to Krakow, to her father's. The rest of the money Bessie invested in a pretty little house in the village where she was stopping, surrounded by a pleasant garden. 
I was now quite easy in my mind as to her subsequent fate. She now had her own house, an honorable title, Uzvagi Kapitanyei, and a certain regular income. In the little village where she was, she could play a leading part. In her present situation, moreover, she was completely protected against all the snares of the evil world. For in this particular village every man was virtuous, and the women ruled them with a rod of iron. To stumble, make a faux pas, and fall into sin was not possible, because it was not allowed. I could now be quite easy as to Bessie's prospects. A woman who had learnt such bitter experience at her own cost could not help drawing conclusions from the past. And if ever she were to make her choice again, she certainly would not allow herself to be led astray by superficial graces, but would judge him whom she might definitely and finally select as the partner of her destiny by his inner worth alone. I even took the trouble, with the true solicitude of a guardian, to write this beautiful and sensible phrase to her in a letter. I also impressed upon her not to give herself away to any official, for the time being, or any other kind of dog-headed tartar, for such a husband could only be provisional. She gave me her word that she would not do so. For nearly four years I heard nothing more of Bessie. She had fallen into the ranks of those women who do nothing to make people talk about them, and this category is the best of all. Every year I sent her the interest on her money. She acknowledged the receipt of it with thanks, and that was all. But I, too, had cause enough not to think of those lovely but dangerous eyes like the sea. My evil stars were in the ascendant. Not a year passed without a heavy blow descending on my head. At one time it was a dear, dead friend whom I had to bury. At another time I had to go through a severe illness which brought me to the very brink of death. I had scarcely recovered when my wife also fell dangerously ill. Through the conduct of persons whom I had regarded as my friends, I very nearly became bankrupt. I had to work day and night at my writing-table to draw myself out of the mire. Then my publisher bolted to America. Then came a year of calamity, when nobody cared a fig for either books or newspapers. Then I had to fight a duel, through no fault of my own. And all along there was the wretched fate of my country, which demanded my help. The whole plan of winning back her confiscated liberties was my secret. I was the organ of the committee, the organ that was tormented, persecuted, insulted by derisive tyranny. Life under such conditions was like a dreadful dream, an incoherent, continually shifting vision of hope, an eternal nightmare, and when I awoke from this nightmare, I found I was quite bald. One fine spring the fairy queen of my fantastic dreams locked me up in prison by way of variation. Nobody can escape his fate. I had founded a political journal. I was its responsible editor and publisher. My assistants were the votadors of the Liberal Party. We soon had a large public. I had quite enough to do. It was my business to write romances for this paper, and leading articles, too. Once an admirably elaborated article was sent to me, assigned by one of the most illustrious names among the Hungarian magnate families. Without much ado, I published it. It was a loyal, patriotic article, on purely constitutional lines, showing in the most matter-of-fact way in the world the justice and the necessity of a constitutional government for Hungary. On account of this article, the governor brought both the count who wrote it and the editor who inserted it before a court-martial. He signified to the pair of us beforehand that he meant to lock us up for three months for it. The court-martial consisted of a colonel, a major, a captain, a senior and a junior lieutenant, a sergeant, a corporal, and a private. The last four were Bohemians. Before this Areopagus I delivered a powerful defense in German, to which they naturally replied, March. The tribunal condemned me and my comrade the Count to twelve months' hard labor in irons, on bread and water, with enforced fasting, loss of nobility, and a fine of a thousand florins. When the sentence was read out, I said to the President, This is very strong. The governor promised us only three months. To this the President responded with a smile, Yes, three months for the incriminated article, but nine more for your high-flying defense. Our sentence was for no offense against the press laws. Oh, dear, no. 
we were condemned for inciting to a breach of the peace. The Count and I had been throwing stones at the windows, and breaking the gas lamps at Carapesi Street. It was as public brawlers that we were sent to cool our heels in jail. The reader must not expect me, however, to weave a martyr's crown for myself, or describe the tortures of the Venetian dungeons. The whole of my life in prison was a pure joke and diversion. The commandant of the place, with whom I lived, used to come every day to tell and be told anecdotes, and then took me out for country walks. He had my writing-table, my books, and my carpentering tools brought to my dungeon, and it was there that I turned out a bust of my wife. The commandant also was passionately fond of carpenter's work, so we worked away together at our lays as if for a wager. There was no talk whatever of chains or fetters, and I was allowed to have with my bread and water the best that money could purchase from the inn. In the afternoons my friends from the Pest Club came to play cards with me, so that when, on one occasion, one of my most radical acquaintances, Benishki, entered my apartment and looked around, he exclaimed with contemptuous indignation, Call this a dungeon? Why, there's no romance at all about this sort of thing. Once I took my fellow prisoner and my jailer to my villa at Svabhagi, where my wife had made ready for us a splendid supper. I tapped my new wine, and we amused ourselves to such a very late hour that when we returned they would hardly let us into prison again. Fortunately we had the provost with us, and with our assistance he managed to force his way in. And then my visitors. In the whole course of my life I never received so many visitors during the month that my year's captivity lasted. In the following month, by the way, I had to make room for the editor of the officious government, who was also condemned by the court-martial for disturbing the public peace. I was sought out in my dungeon by all sorts of good friends, who came from far, lords and ladies, countesses and actresses. It happened that once a magnate's wife, who was a great invalid and therefore could not ascend to the second flight where our prison was, begged us to come down to her carriage, and there we received our visitor in the street, poor slaves that we were. In fact, I had too much of a good thing. How could I work when my admirers were crowding at my latch all day long? At last I had to beg my jailer, with tears in my eyes, to sentence me to solitary confinement for a couple of hours every day, and write on my door the hours when I was free to receive company. Wasn't I in prison? I said. I had an honest bohemian lad as my servant. His name was Wenceslas. We soon got to understand each other very well. I explained to him that at certain hours when I was sitting down to work nobody was to be admitted, except when a pretty woman came to see me. On soit qui mal y pense. And singularly enough, one cannot imagine a more convenient place for an assassination than such a dungeon as mine. I only wonder that our bon viviers have not grasped the fact. And what a capital place for an afternoon nap such a locality really is. The best advice I can give to any one who suffers from sleeplessness is, get yourself locked up. Is it not a special mercy of providence that slaves can sleep so soundly? One afternoon Wenceslas aroused me from my sweet afternoon nap, with the intimation that a pretty woman wanted to speak to me. Really pretty? Oh, yes. Oh, yes? Oh, yes, yes. It was, indeed, oh, yes, for it was Bessie. She was dressed in complete mourning, with a black silk veil over her head. I saw from her eyes that she was in mourning for my fate. I anticipated her by making her a compliment. Why, how very nice you look, my dear ward. The country air seems to agree with you. With this I put a stop to her tearful anxiety on my account. I see that the air of a dungeon has not done you much harm, either. And how did you get in here? Not very easily, I can tell you. They would hardly let me in. They said that the prisoner was confined to his room. I thought of giving the warder a box on the ears, and then perhaps they would have shut me up along with you by way of punishment. That would have, indeed, been a heavy chain to bear. She laughed. I understand the illusion. My figure has become a little sturdy, I know. What else has a person to do in a little country town but grow fat? It is a sign of peace of mind, I said. 
I offered her my armchair, and in this act of politeness she read another allusion. "'It has strong legs, I hope,' said she, as she sat down in it. I must candidly admit that her figure had grown pronouncedly rotund, but this by no means injured her beauty. She really looked quite appetizing. I was glad, too, to see her again. "'Don't take my remarks amiss,' I said. It is so good for the poor slave when a smiling lady's face lights up the gloom of his dungeon. A sweet, melodious woman's voice sounds so consolingly amidst the clanking of his fetters. I am glad to see that you preserve your good humor, for I have come to you on a very serious business. What? Then it was not tender sympathy for the poor captive that brought you hither? That also, I may even say principally, Every day I read, in the Fovarosi Lapak, how many and what sort of visitors you receive, noble ladies, pretty actresses, and what not. Well, thought I, if they may go and see him, it is only my duty to go too. At the same time, there are other circumstances which have brought me here. At this she furtively looked around her. Won't they hear what we are talking about through the door? Have no fear, that room is empty. My fellow prisoner is provided with a separate apartment. I have come to inform you of something. I have petitioned the office of wards to relieve you from your guardianship. And you very good cause, too, I think, seeing that I myself have been under guardianship for some time. That's not my reason, however. But my position has now become such as to make it indispensable for me to have the free disposal of my money. May I guess the cause? Another misfortune has happened. We have lost our heart again, eh? Bessie covered her blushing face with her silk veil. Eh, but how do you always detect a thing at once? You would have made a capital magistrate. But it is such a natural thing to suppose. You are so young, you know. I am well advanced in the thirties. You are only four years over thirty. I ought to know, for I was at your christening. Then you have once more discovered your ideal— this time I most solemnly believe that I really have found him. But no provisional person, I hope. Don't insult me, please. I am above such a thing, but as your guardian, I would not have given my consent to it, so I was bound to suppose that that was why you wanted to be freed from my guardianship. Not at all. In the future I also mean to take your advice as though it came from my own father. Scold me as much as you like when you catch me tripping. I will continue to be your obedient ward if only you don't shut the door in my face. All I want is my money. Believe me when I say I will do nothing frivolous with it. The sum will remain to my credit, but I wish to be free to use it as I like in the future. I presume your bridegroom is some squire to whom the amount will be of service? He is not a squire. Then perhaps he is a merchant. That also is an honorable walk in life. In good commercial hands the amount will yield a nice income. He is not a merchant. Then perhaps he is a manufacturer, and the proprietor of a sawmill or a steam mill? Neither the one nor the other. Then what on earth is he? My bridegroom is a worthy and eminent schoolmaster, whose name is Isaias Medvesi. Isaias Medvesi? But what the deuce does a village schoolmaster want with twenty-five thousand florins? I'll tell you presently, but I must go a little farther back first. Have you the time to listen to my story? Of course I have. I remain home all day. Will no one interrupt us? My servant is a very sensible fellow. He knows the rules of the place. But they won't lock the door of the prison behind me? An ordinary person would have replied to this question that it would have been no great harm if they did, but I pulled out the drawer of my writing-table, and showed the fair lady that I had my own key for opening my prison door. At this she laughed, and seemed quite satisfied. Well, I'll begin telling you how I made his acquaintance. What, your Ezzy? I beg your pardon, but you must always pronounce the name in full, or you will aggravate its owner. He is very particular about giving to every one his full name and corresponding titles. He never breaks that rule himself and constantly addresses me as worthy dame captain. It is in vain to call me madam in his presence, for he roundly maintains that such a title belongs to the consort of the Prince of Transylvania only. His motto is suum cruque. Oh, I've learned such a lot of Latin since I made his acquaintance. 
Oh, then you've been taking Latin lessons from him, and so the acquaintance began? No irony, please. It didn't begin that way at all. I suppose you know that in our little town there is a very well-attended Calvinist church? I know it pretty well. And I am a very zealous churchgoer? That I did not know. With us the laudable custom prevails of going to church every Sunday for the purpose of devotion. And to show off your bonnets? Don't make fun of me, please. Isaias is not only the schoolmaster, but the cantor and the organist as well. He has a splendid bass voice. When he intones the verse, How blessed the man whose walk in life! The whole podium trembles. It was that wondrously beautiful voice which first enthralled me. But I should have thought that the organ would have drowned the sound of the hymn. But not only in church have I had the opportunity of hearing him, but at funerals also. Then you condescend to go to funerals, too? Not as a habit, but you must know that most of the people there beg me to act as sponsor to their newborn children. Now, two-thirds of our children seem only born to die, and I am obliged to always go to the funerals of my little protégés. Then Isaias is in the habit of speaking and singing over them? Yes, and what beautiful speeches they are, too, all in verse. So Isaias is a poet into the bargain? Yes, he really makes the most beautiful verses. And I've no doubt he wrote a nice onomasticon on St. Elizabeth's Day? He did nothing of the kind. He is not that sort of man. It is not his habit to flatter anybody. On the contrary, he always tells them the truth to their faces. That is generally the distinguishing characteristic of all Calvinist schoolmasters. Well, but let us keep to the point. I left off at the funerals, I think. I was struck by the frequent mortality among our little ones, and set in movement a project among the ladies of the town for starting a creche. The idea found zealous partisans. We soon found a large meeting-room. The ladies supplied linen in large quantities. Milk and other necessary aliments were provided by public subscription. Money we resolved to collect in the usual way. By a charitable concert? I see that you are a practical man. A charitable concert was indeed arranged and a committee of seven appointed to manage it. The sessions of this committee were held in my house. Mine was the most convenient locality, and I had a piano besides. Every member of the committee had her part assigned to her. One was to recite, another to sing a solo, a third to give a comic greeting, a fourth to play a piece on the piano, a fifth to dance a Hungarian dance. I was to fiddle. Isaias was to sing the high priest's aria from the opera of Nubuco. He who trusts in the Lord, you know the rest. Of course I do. At the first meeting of the committee, one of the members had a slight misunderstanding with another member. At the second meeting, a second member had a second misunderstanding. And by the time the fifth meeting was held, Isaias and yourself were left to practice alone. That is, word for word, what did happen, with this little difference, that we never had any practice at all. On the fifth occasion, four of the six members of the committee sent letters of excuse. Every one of them was ill. It was a veritable epidemic. Only the dancing-master found no excuse for himself. As he was the only dancing-master in the town, he could not go and lie that he had sprained his foot. Isaias walked three times up and down in front of my house, puffing away at his big pipe. Every time he passed, he looked up at the window and, seeing nobody there, went on farther. At last the dancing-master came, chasing up. I could see from his grinning face that he had some ill tidings to tell me. Only people who have found some excuse for covering their retreat come smiling like that. My lady, I am inconsolable. I know all about that, thought I. But I can't come to the concert. Our gypsy musicians have gone to Pest. What do they want there? I asked. All the gypsy bands in the kingdom have assembled together for a grand competition, now, without gypsy music, I can't dance. Who can play me the Bihari Kergaso? I should like to know. I will, I said. Ah, that won't do at all. What, one dancer and one violin player? It would be a mere farce. Hereupon, Isaias popped in. Seeing through the window that I was no longer alone, he took heart and came in. He had not dared to do so before. Here I intervened. If I am not very much mistaken, I know this dear Isaias of yours. It once happened to him, while still a student, that he sat beside the priest's daughter at supper. He did not dare say a word to her, 
but in the afternoon he went up the church tower and courted the young lady from one of the windows. It is possible that it was he. I, however, made both the gentlemen stay, that at least the coffee and the cowl skippers might not be wasted. They did not wait to be asked twice, but ate with right good will. During the meal we fully discussed the best means of helping forward the stranded concert. Suddenly the dancing-master looked at his watch. Gracious me, if it isn't six o'clock, I must be off to give the children of the chief magistrate a dancing lesson. And with that he jumped up, kissed my hand, and pirouetted off. Then Isaias also rose from the table, brushed the crumbs of the cowl-skippers from his coat, and said, Blessing and peace be with you. This was always his parting formula, such a salutation as, Your humble servant, or, I commend myself to your protection, nobody has ever heard from his lips. No, not even his superintendent. For Isaias is not humble, and your servant, and does not commend himself to anybody, nor will he tell a lie even as a matter of form. What, must you go too? I replied to his blessing and peace. You have no six o'clock school this evening. No, but why should I stay here if there's to be no practice? Must I, then, begin singing in my own house before a man? It depends upon the man, replied Esaias. What am I to understand by that? I inquired, much astonished. What are you to understand by that? said he, striking the leg of his boot repeatedly with his pipe-stem. What are you to understand by that? It is not very hard to understand, I should think. If a lawyer, a doctor, or a squire were to come here to see you, and amuse himself here with or without music, not a dog in the village would have anything to bark at. But if they saw the schoolmaster come here at six o'clock in the afternoon, if they saw him, I say, remain here last of all when the other guests were gone, then there would be such a stir in Israel that men would be ready to stone me. Do I stand, then, in such evil odor as all that? I did not say you were in any evil odor at all. It is true, he continued, that there are as many names written in your album as in Charles Trachner's almanac. That, however, does a pretty woman no harm. But me the church would not forgive. If I get into evil odor, if I overstep the line, I shall be sent packing. Then celibacy obtains among the Calvinists also? Not celibacy, but we have the canonical prescriptions. A canonical offense is a very serious business for a Calvinist priest or schoolmaster. Let a man be a veritable John Chrysostom, and it will avail him nothing if he commit a canonical offense. And you have never committed a canonical offense, I said to him. Never, he replied resolutely, and he grew quite red in the face. He was so proud of his virtue. Why, surely this is quite a new thing, I interrupted. A thing never known in the world before? A man who is virtuous, and not ashamed to confess it? Quite unique, isn't it? When I heard this, I seized his hand and would not let him leave me. I could read from his eyes that it was the first time he had ever felt the pressure of a lady's hand. You have been candid, I said to him. I will be candid also. You would never approach a woman whom you had not led to the altar. I know it. Then you shall lead me to the altar." Even this did not seem to surprise him. His face remained as motionless as a statue. "'That is soon done,' said he. "'But, respice finem, man proposes, but tis an old dog that holds on. I am not like other men. I am a very difficult man to get on with. You can't deal with me as with those who look through their fingers at the goings-on of their spouses. If I take you to wife, there must be an end to all this dancing and prancing and gadding about and flirting and oogling. My wife will not have to go fasting, but she won't be allowed any junketing. I don't understand a joke. Do you see this cherry wood pipe stem? If I catch my wife at any piece of trickery, I'll break this cherry stem across her back. Take my word for it. I couldn't help smiling at this. And you, my dear pretty ward, have actually taken the schoolmaster to husband, cherry stem and all? I should like to have taken him, but he didn't surrender himself so easily. I assured him that I would submit myself to the most stringent discipline of virtue, and if I transgressed against him, I should not mind his beating me. But even that did not vanquish him. By no means whatever could he be brought to sit down beside me on the sofa. He even pushed back the chair on which he was sitting, when he saw that I was besieging him. At last he brought his big guns to bear upon me. 
Look now, my dear dame. I know very well that humorous habit of yours of never remaining long in one nest. You deal with your sweethearts on a sort of give-and-take system. You are here to-day and off to-morrow. Supposing now that in the exercise of my marital authority I were to inflict an edifying chastisement upon you for your flightiness, you might easily take it into your head to bolt, and there should I be left in the lurch for the finger of scorn to point at. A Calvinist schoolmaster cannot submit to the fate of an ordinary man. If my wife were to leave me, I should be expelled from the church with contumely. Then I should have to flee. I should be as good as excluded from human society. Now, I am very well satisfied with my present condition. I have a fixed salary of six hundred florins in good hard cash, and my perquisites amount to about as much again. I live honorably, you see, and I cannot afford to stake everything on a throw of the dice. Then I talked big also. Listen to me, I said. I have capital sufficient to bring me in as much as your yearly income, that is to say, twenty-five thousand florins. I will make over the whole amount to you by way of a dower, and I am ready to forfeit it all in case I am unfaithful to you. And didn't your Isaias capitulate even then? I inquired of Bessie. He asked for three days to think about it. I immediately hastened to you to signify my desire that your guardianship might cease. Then Isaias has still two days' grace, I said. I hope and trust he will be inwardly illuminated to say no. Then you do not approve of my determination. I am a friend of truth, and I understand a little about prophecy, too. It doesn't matter to me if you surrender all your capital as a sort of shrift money, and your house as well. Such a man as he is worthy of it. I'll take your word for it. You are something of an expert in such matters. But one thing I strongly advise you to do. Keep the garden attached to the house at your own disposition. Why? That you may have it planted full of cherry trees. I know the natural history of the Calvinist schoolmaster species. I know that once he has promised he always performs. I also know the natural history of the lady with the eyes like the sea, and it is my belief that you will frequently give occasion for the employment of cherry-tree stems. At this the fair lady sprang from her chair, boiling over with rage. What a gross monster it is! Poet, indeed! A pedantic lout is what I call you. They've done very well to lock you up. This is the last time we shall ever talk to each other. And with that she went, or rather flounced, away. But I gave a great sigh of relief. May she keep her word and never, never come back again, I said. One of the first things I saw on my release from prison was the announcement in the newspapers of the solemnization of the marriage. The bank also informed me by letter that the amount there standing to the credit of my ward had been transferred to her husband's name. Well, at last Bessie had got the knee pulse ultra of husbands, for, really, the man who has reached his two-and-thirtieth year without sinning against the canonical prescriptions must indeed be a superlative treasure in the eyes of a lady who knows how to appreciate the value of such renunciation. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of Eyes Like the Sea by Mor Yokoi, translated by R. Nisbet Bain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Well, the long and short of it is, confess I must, that I have a sweetheart for whose sake I have been unfaithful, not only to my wife, but to my muse also. A sweetheart who has enmeshed me in her spider's web, and sucked my heart's blood dry, who has appropriated my best ideas, made me scamper after her from one end of the kingdom to the other, and whose slave I was, and still am. Often I have wasted half my fortune upon her, and rushed blindly into misfortune to please her. For her I have patiently endured insult, ridicule, and reprobation. For her sake I have staked life and liberty. Sometimes, when I have felt the pinch of her tyranny, I have tried to escape from her, but she has enticed me back again, and would not let me go. Now, if she had been some pretty young damsel, there might have been some excuse for me, but she was a nasty, old, painted figurehead of a bedlam, a flirting, faithless, fickle, foul-mouthed, scandal-mongering old liar, whom the world courts, 
who makes fools of all her wooers, and changes her lovers as often as she changes her dress. Her name is Politica, and may the plague take her. There was one particular year in which I was over head and ears in love with her, and did absolutely everything she wanted. On her account I fell out with a very good friend of mine who was the very right hand of my newspaper. I fought, also on her account, a duel with pistols with another good friend of mine, who had no more offended me than I had ever offended him. In fact, we had always respected each other most highly. But Politica insisted upon it, and so we banged away at each other. And then she hounded me on against a third good friend of mine, who was an excellent fellow, and a Hungarian minister of state to boot, and induced me to endeavor to thwart his election. And I actually did make this excellent fellow's election fall through, this good friend whom I respected, loved, and honored. Politica demanded it. What a parade she made when she dragged me along after her triumphal car! She actually made me believe that I was now the most famous man in the whole kingdom, and she made me pay for her precious favors, too. What petite super for five hundred men at a time! What hundreds of carriages! What toilettes! But in those days I was quite wrapped up in her. After my great triumph, a torrent of congratulatory letters and telegrams showered down upon me. I had actually upset a cabinet minister. That was a triumph. Everyone who, at any time or under any circumstances, had been acquainted with me, called upon me after my brilliant success. Old schoolfellows with whom I had formerly fought in the playground now recollected me. There was a brisk demand for my autograph. I was proud of it all. I was not even surprised, therefore, when one afternoon they brought me in a visiting card with the name Mrs. Elias Medvesey upon it. It was very natural that she also should visit me. The sunbeams of my glory had melted the ice of her displeasure. Six years had now passed since I had seen her. I could imagine how she had filled out in the meantime. Well taken care of, with no vexations to worry her, harassed by no passions, what other fate could possibly await my fair ideal than to grow fat? All the more startled was I, therefore, when I did see her. She had grown quite gaunt. Her old-fashioned dress, which had been made to fit fuller forms, hung loosely about her. Her face, once so rosy and gay, was now lean and haggard. Somber wrinkles, which met together beneath her chin, had taken the place of her roguish dimples. Only by her eyes could I recognize her. They were still the eyes of yore. When she saw me, she forced a smile, but I could see how much it cost her. I have never thought it a proper question to ask anyone whose face has altered a good deal, are you ill, but she herself led up to it. I've changed greatly, haven't I? Tis a wonder that you would recognize me. I have been very ill. I have just come from the doctor. I have been suffering from a quart and ague which our country doctors could not drive away. But otherwise you are all right, I trust? No, I am not. I fancy that my physical ailment is only as stubborn as it is, because my mind also is not as it should be. I asked her what was the matter. I have come on purpose to tell you. You always gave me good advice, and I never took it. It may be that I wouldn't take it even now, but at least it would relieve my mind to tell you all about it. I have a secret desire which is destroying my whole soul. I go to sleep with it, and I wake up with it. What desire can it be? If you but look at my face, you can easily see that it is no sinful affection. And yet it must be kept secret. Yes, for I go about day and night with the thought of becoming a Catholic. I was so startled by this that, in my amazement, I knew not what to say to her. It is my fixed resolution, the only thing that can give my soul peace on earth and salvation in heaven, is conversion to the Roman Catholic Church. How did you come by this resolution? There is no Catholic Church in the town where you reside. But there is a monastery quite close to it, a sweet, quiet, pleasant place. I am wont to go there when they are not watching me. A mere accident moved me at first. Curiosity led me into the church when I heard the holy chants through the door. But now it is devotion which leads me there. Ah, 
how much more sublime a place it is than our bald, bare place of worship. Wherever I look I see groups of holy figures who bless and beckon me, and those sublime chants, which seem to come from the angelic chorus of heaven, and ravish my soul away to a world unknown, but oh, how ardently desired! And then the deep silence, which is scarcely broken by the solemn sanctus bell, and then the form of the priest himself, who, like a supernatural being, speaks before the altar in a language which men may not, but God does, understand. When I come out of such a church it seems to me as if I have been speaking to God. I began thinking what would be the end of it all. The lady became insistent. What do you advise? What shall I do? My soul compels me to it. My dear friend, I replied, you know that I am a Protestant, and as a Protestant I am liberally and indulgently inclined towards every other creed. I advise nobody to change his religion, neither do I dissuade him from doing so. I have a real veneration for the Catholic faith. I consider its ritual majestic and sublime, and its ceremonies are undoubtedly imposing and touching. Had I been born a Catholic, I should have been an ardent champion of my church. But how can I approve of the conversion of a person in your position? Do you not reflect that your husband is an officer of the Calvinist communion? But it is the very prosaic nature of this communion which offends me. For in what a dull manner do our elders and deacons perform their sacred functions? Prayer, sermons, hymns, everything with them is a mere matter of enforced routine. How can they inspire others who have not themselves the gift of grace? Such people can only mock at and speak scornfully of their neighbor's faith because they have no real faith of their own. But pray recollect that a Protestant schoolmaster loses his post if his wife changes her religion. He may lose his material comforts, but I lose the repose of my soul. My dear Bessie, I can imagine that a woman with extraordinarily sensitive nerves may find no consolation in Puritan simplicity. If you would seek refuge in true devotion, procure Alec's prayer book, the manual of Catholic prayers, you know. In that book you'll find everything that is sublime, majestic, and heavenly in Catholic theology. Pray out of that book when you are alone and nobody sees you. That is not enough for me. Religion does not consist in prayers and singing alone. Then perhaps it is the pomp of the external ceremonies which has had such an effect on your mind? That affects me least of all. But there is in the Catholic Church an institution as sublime as it is comforting, an institution sufficient of itself to spread the Catholic religion all over the round world, wherever there are hearts that bleed, wherever there are those who suffer from other than merely material aches and pains. That institution is confession. It was a gross blunder of John Calvin not to have retained that institution for the faithful. He did not know the heart, especially the female heart. There is no greater torture in this world than to carry about in one's soul night and day an evil thought which harasses and pursues, and be unable to tell it to anybody. A Catholic woman can always find a word of consolation for her despair, a hand stretched out to raise her when she falls. She has a refuge among the accusations of her own conscience. If she has sinned, she can beg for absolution, and her soul is lightened of its load. But who can absolve me? To whom can I tell what tortures me within? Her eyes were fixed and staring like the eyes of a somnambulist who sees nothing before her but a visionary world which others do not see, and at the same time she raised her index finger and laid it on her parched and cracking lips, as if to keep back the moanings of her dumb distress. I was deeply grieved for her. She had no need to tell me what she felt. Her features spoke for themselves, and said how much she must have suffered since the last change in her life. My dear friend, I said at last, you have now known me for a long time, and you know that I have always been your well-wisher. If you have any bitter thought which oppresses you, confess it to me. Amongst Protestants every man is a priest. That is our fundamental dogma. Confess to me. She smiled strangely, just as a sick man smiles when the doctor tries to persuade him that he really is well, while he himself is thinking all the time, Just you wait a bit, and I'll turn the joke against you, and die. 
You will receive my confession, then? Yes, and rest assured that I'll keep the solemn secret as sacred as a consecrated priest. As long as I am alive, at any rate. After I am dead, I don't care what you do. You may then proclaim it to the world, if you like. When I am dead, I authorize you to write a romance about me. A romance like mine you have never written yet. But till then, not a word to any one of what you will now hear from me. To nobody, not even to your wife. Promise me that. Your word of honor on it. My friend, there is a crypt within my breast for buried secrets. Your secret shall repose among the rest. She bent down to my ear, her burning breath scorched my face, and she whispered, I confess to you that I wish to kill my husband. Horrified, I looked into her eyes. They flashed up at me like the eyes of devils. That wish of hers was a real, living wish. And what I've said, I'll do. She pressed her lips together till they were quite thin, and her eyes distended into orbs filled with threatening fire. Good heavens! What thought is this? She looked at me with a malicious smile. There, you see you are no priest. You can give no absolution. Nor would a priest give you absolution either. A priest can impose penance for sin repented of, but he cannot give indulgence beforehand for a meditated crime. A priest could only say to you what I say now. Fly to God and cleanse your soul from this dark thought. How could you ever have suffered it to enter your soul? That good and gentle soul of yours, that used to always love, and never to hate. Yes, such I ever was, was I not? I was indeed a loving fool. You once wrote a tale which I remember reading when a child. In this tale a distracted heart relates how many ways there are of extinguishing life. Amongst other things written there is this, that if honey is allowed to stand till it rots, it turns into the deadliest venom. This is quite true as to the honey with which the heart of a poor, credulous woman is full, but it is not true with regard to the honey of the field. I have tried and found that it is not true. Believe me, neither case is true. In married life there is no such sea of bitterness as cannot be made sweet again by a single drop of love. Alas, what I suffer exceeds even the power of your imagination. Contempt, degradation, is my daily bread. Insult follows upon every step I take. When I speak, my words are misinterpreted. When I am silent, I am chided. When I weep, I am bullied and browbeaten. Do you think that perhaps your husband suspects your intention of changing your faith? So much he knows, that I frequently visit the monastery, and often have talks with one of the monks. I solemnly swear that I have talked to him about nothing but religion and holy things. He, however, accuses me of the nastiest things. Then when we sit together at table, he poisons every dish I eat by singing the most derisive songs he can think of about those women who rave about cowls and cossacks. In fact, he is always singing such songs in my presence. But, my dear friend, you take these things too tragically. These derisive songs have been sung time out of mind. Your husband has not invented them for your special aggravation. Laugh at him to his face, and he'll hold his tongue. Very well, then. Let what he does to ridicule me be forgiven. But ever since he has begun to suspect my spiritual condition, he leaves no stone unturned to disturb my devotions. If in the afternoon or evening, when the chiming of the cloister bell is wafted over us, I involuntarily join my hands together, he laughs at me. Ha ha, they are ringing the bells to call you to prayer, are they? Now, the Calvinists do not ring for evening prayers, neither do they sound the Angelus, and this is a great grief to me. It is like rolling my bread in the mud and then making me eat it. This continual ridiculing clings to me like tar. It chokes. It nauseates. I feel just as if I were swimming in a sea of glue. He relates to me the most villainous anecdotes about the holy images. Last Saturday it rained the whole morning, and I could not go to town. He saw my impatience, and said to me derisively, Never mind, thou female, it will clear up this afternoon, for the Virgin Mary wants to dry her son's little shirt for Sunday. It was well for him that he left the room that instant, for I was very near driving my knife into his heart. 
I tried to quiet the excited creature by saying that though this was no very reverent jest, yet it was not an invention of Esaias's. This jest about the breaking out of the sunshine on Saturday afternoon was a common saying among the Hungarian country folk, and, taken seriously, had nothing really impious about it, representing, indeed, that sacred figure whom all of us are bound to reverence as a provident mother from the homely, rustic point of view. I don't like to hear that name on his lips. Why, I sent away an old servant of mine called Marxa for no other reason than because her master was always calling her Maria, and every such time it was as if a dagger were piercing my heart. I saw that the woman was really suffering. It was a case where a heroic remedy was required. My dear friend, I said, I cannot blame your husband. Your religious extravagance, which has been not a little stimulated by the irritability of your nerves and the nostrums which the provincial doctors have made you drink, is a question of to be or not to be for your husband. If you cling to the saints, poor Isaias will feel the earth giving way beneath him. You are bound to one another, remember. If you go and seek heaven in another church, you will only install hell in your own house. Believe me, if your husband discovers your design, he will fly into fury and tear you to pieces. If I were you, I should go to some medicinal watering place and get your nerves braced up a bit. I see, I see. You do not understand what is the matter with me. You think it is a mere feminine ailment, which is, generally, half affectation. Look at that recipe. The most famous doctor in the capital prescribed it for me. I went to him. He diagnosed me. He said that the country doctors had not treated my case properly. They had stuffed me full of quinine, he said, and it was not the medicament that I wanted. So he prescribed me another. Read it. I looked at the prescription and saw that it was arsenic. The doctor prescribed six drops for the first day, and a drop more every other day up to twenty drops, then back by single drops to six again. Then my fever will return no more but he cautioned me to keep most strictly to his prescription, as the remedy was a very dangerous one. Is that so? It is. I have had it made up in the Yosefaro's dispensary. And with that she drew out the flask from her pocket and showed it to me. That will do for me. I will now go with this prescription to all the ten apothecaries in the town and have it made up by every one of them. Ten times the strength will certainly do for him." Horrified, I seized her hand. Miserable woman, what wouldst thou do? Surely not commit murder. Wouldst thou poison thy husband's body and my soul? Every time I have thought of thee, I have seen thee before me in the idealized form of my pure love of early days. And wilt thou now put horror and aversion in the place of it? Give me that prescription. With terrified, staring eyes and trembling in every nerve, the woman fell down on her knees before me, and when I said to her, Hitherto thou hast always had a place in my prayers, dost thou wish me to cast thee forth from my remembrance with curses? She began to smile. Tis the first time in your life that you have vowed me. Let me then return the compliment. But no, I cannot vow thee. The word thou cannot come out of my mouth. Don't lift me up. Let me kneel before you. I fain would only weep but no tears will flow. Here is the prescription. Destroy it if you like. I was mad. I knew not what I said. Tis true. If life be grievous to me, tis I who ought to die. What you say now is also a sin. Heaven does not give us that divine spark, the spirit, only that we may fling it back again. Learn to bear your sorrows in silence. Every one of us has his cross which God has laid upon him that he may carry it, if you would believe in the saints, follow their example. Be a martyr, if God so wills it. That is the real Catholic faith. She began to sob, but after some little difficulty I contrived to pacify her. I also provided her with all sorts of good homely counsels. A good wife, I said, ought to humor her husband, and not sit in judgment on his faults. I told her to bring him to me, and introduce me to him, Perhaps I might make some impression on him, and prevail upon him not to press his crotchets too far. It was even possible that I might find him some work to do, 
something relating to spiritual subjects which might occupy his mind, kindle his ambition, and make him peel off his cynical husk. No doubt he was a good and worthy man, who only needed to be properly taken in hand to get on very well. The lady, with the eyes like the sea, listened with many shakes of the head, but she had gradually grown much more quiet. Those eyes of her, how they could express gratitude! It really seemed as if, beneath the influence of my words, her face was recovering the rosy hue that it had lost. Alas, no! Vain thought! "'Twas not my words, but something else. "'She arose and rallied her spirits. "'Very well. I'll take your advice. "'I will endure. I will be patient. "'I will down with every evil thought. "'I will show that I can be a good wife. "'You shall be satisfied with me. "'But one thing I'll tell you. "'My husband has threatened to strike me. "'If ever he does that, "'then God be merciful to both him and me.' Now I knew why her face had turned so red. If my husband dishonors me by a single blow, I swear that I'll seize a gun and shoot him dead. And with that she rushed out of the room. I felt as if I ought to call after her. Don't go home, wretched woman. It was too late. She was already outside the door. She had vanished like a vision of the night. End of chapter 20 Chapter Twenty One of Eyes Like the Sea by Mor Yokoi, translated by R. Nisbet Bain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Ah, what an ocean of time has passed since this happened! It must be twenty years at least. It makes me giddy when I look back upon it. But how many evil years there were! How many days that I do not love to think about! How many have been torn from my side to whom life was a joy, and on whom the future smiled, and I still remain. Only here and there, now and again, perhaps, do I encounter a grey-headed shape like myself, a relic from that brilliant time, and what a joy it then is to look back upon those old days and say, It is not so good now as it was then. Some years ago I was on a visit of inspection among our large national state prisons. I happened to be at Ska Moisovar and Ileva, where the aristocracy of crime is collected together, persons condemned to a term of imprisonment exceeding ten years, all of them criminals once under sentence of death, but reprieved by an act of grace. Here were interesting studies of the night side of human nature. I also visited the Maria Nostra. Here the female criminals resided, and nuns were the warders. This house of correction can only be visited by special permission of the ministry. There the discipline is strict, but the prisoners are very well treated. Last of all we visited the day-room, where the prisoners were at work. They all sat in a long room and were sewing. Those who could do the finer sort of work were at little tables of their own. I stopped before one of such tables. A woman was sewing some sort of child's garment, it is the rule that when a visitor stops before a table of one of the felons, she shall immediately rise from her seat and, whether asked or unasked, say what her crime is and how long her term of imprisonment. She arose when I stood before her table. Her hair was as white as autumn gossamers, but her eyes still flashed with their old varying fires. They were still, as of old, the flaming eyes like the sea. In a dull monotone she told me her crime and her sentence. I killed my husband. I am condemned to imprisonment for life. For life? And life so long? Can I not use my interest in your favor? I thank you, but it is well with me here. I wish for nothing more in this world. And with that she returned to her place and went on with her work. Poor little Bessie! Last year I received a letter announcing her death. It was her last wish that I, but nobody else, should be informed of it. End of chapter 21 And the End of Eyes Like the Sea by Mor Yokoi Translated by R. Nisbet Bain